All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So welcome back. Just a reminder once again, so we're going to have no class on this Thursday. So we will just pick up uh, from where we leave off today uh, in one week. So we're a little bit ahead, so I really don't think it's going to uh, slow down or alter the pace, which is great. Um, and today we're going to start off with some simultaneous supply and demand shifts. So looking at uh, that equilibrium, doo, doo, doo. so I actually don't want full page view, just kidding. And so remember when we have that equilibrium, we have a price y-axis, a quantity x-axis, you have a downward sloping demand curve, an upward sloping supply curve, and where they meet is that magical point, that magical price where the quantity supplied equals the quantity demanded. And so we call that guy Q star. So we talked about how if the price is above that equilibrium price, that's going to create a surplus. There's going to be too much supplied compared to what's demanded. If the price is above it, right? Well, if the demand is going to be right over here, and the supply is going to be all the way over here. We talked about how if the price was too low, we would have a shortage. The supply would be all the way down here, and the demand would be over here. So the equilibrium is this point where everything that's produced is purchased, and everything that is desired is available for purchasing, is, 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 uh, is available on the market. So one of the nice things about these models is that they can tell us some predictions about what happens to the equilibrium price and quantity, which is what we finished off on in class last week. But it's not always uh, as simple as that, especially when there's multiple things happening. So in order to get into the simultaneous supply and demand shifts, let's start doing just some regular uh, supply demand shifts, and then we'll, uh, we'll do a couple of simultaneous ones. So the first one is just going to be a single shift here. And so get a new color. And so the first one here is going to be in the market for lettuce, right? So every, every now and again, we hear something about how, you know, uh, a severe freeze has destroyed a sizable portion of the lettuce crop, right? So there's a severe freeze. Destroying that lettuce. So what is this going to do? Number one, is this going to impact our supply or our demand? Supply, supply right? Why is it going to impact our supply? Because, yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those determinants of supplies, right? So we know it's going to be supply. And why? Because one of our determinants is literally weather. So that's our determinant. And so we ask ourselves, whenever we have a supply situation, we ask ourselves, we draw a little supply curve to the left, a supply curve to the right, right? We fix the price and we say, okay, at, at, at this price, do I think that I'm going to produce less or more lettuce given what's happened? And so since I think that there's going to be a decrease in my quantity supplied as a result, that means that there's going to be a shift leftwards in your supply curve. Questions on that? And lettuce. Cool. So the next one, we're getting a little bit more esoteric. We're kind of, uh, you know, departing from our usual, uh, you know, things that we're, 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 we typically buy our typical basket of goods, so to speak. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, exchange rates. So if any of you have ever traveled abroad, you've had some familiarity with this. But uh, it's no surprise that, you know, other countries use other kinds of money. And so when we're talking about 
exchange rates, we're talking about the price of a dollar, uh, or sorry, the dollar price of things like a euro. So the price axis here would be the dollar price of one, so exactly one euro. And then over here, this is going to be the quantity of euros. So just like any other commodity, we treat these foreign exchange currencies as commodities, as, as, as if they were corn, as if they were lettuce. And so what, were, what, what would happen if all of a sudden, you know, there's some new amazing German electric car that is, uh, you know, overtaking Tesla and it's way cheaper and all this other kind of stuff, right? So a lot of the U.S. automakers are going to want to be buying this German car. So what's going to happen to the supply and demand for euros? Is the demand going to go up? The demand is going to go up. Very good. What's your name? Uh, Sawyer. Sawyer. Good job. Yes, absolutely. The demand will definitely go up. So they're going to want more of those because they, in order to buy that new car, they're going to need more euros. So this is going to be an increase in the popularity of German cars. That's going to lead to an increase in the desire to hold euros, to use some economic speak. And then that's going to lead to an increase in the demand for euros. Whee. So questions on just a single supply, single demand shift should be just review. Awesome. Moving right along. Let's get into some simultaneous stuff. All right, so our market here is going to be the market for pink, specifically pink, salmon. Chicken of the sea. And so we're going to talk about the, what happened to the supply and demand uh, for pink salmon in the last few decades. And so uh, essentially what ended up happening is there was an increase in buyers' income. And then we're going to assume what? We're going to assume that pink salmon is a normal good. And when I say normal good, do I mean like it's just like an everyday household good? No, I have a specific definition, right? It means as income increases, more people are going to be consuming pink salmon as compared to something that might be an inferior good, which would be something like canned salmon, right? So incomes increased. And so people wanted higher quality, fresh frozen fish, right? So, you know, Chinook, sockeye, coho salmon, all those kind of things. At the same time, there was an increase in a new technology of farm fishing, right? So uh, fish farming where salmon are raised in ocean net pens. So what is this, what are these two things going to do to our supply and demand curves? So what's the increase in income going to do if pink salmon is a normal good? Casey. It'll increase the demand. 
It'll increase the demand. Very good. So our demand is going to shift outwards. Oop, let's use a different color. Demand is going to shift outwards as a result of that. Very good. So now, before we do anything else, let's take a look at what happened to the equilibrium price and quantity. So let's say the old equilibrium price and quantity is this gray. Boop, 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 boop. Price, quantity. Our new one will be this green that's associated with this new demand curve. P double star. Q double star. So when we have a single shift, it's very easy, right? It's unambiguous in terms of what happens to the new equilibrium price and quantity. Right? Our price increases and our quantity also increases. Now let's go ahead and let's remove some of this, some of these arrows, just because it's going to make things a little bit noisier. And now let's talk about what happens when there's this new fish farming technology at the same exact time. What is a new fish farming technology going to do, Madison? Not here. Sammy. Increase the Very good. Yes, increase the supply. So once again, one of the ways that we can do this is we can draw a dotted line supply to the left and to the right. We can fix the price and we can say, OK, am I going to be producing less or producing more? Given this technology, I'm going to be producing more. So as a result, it's going to be a shift outwards in supply. Very good. Boop, 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 boop. Clean this guy up. The wonders of control Z. All right. Um, and so that new supply curve is going to shift out. So we're already at this equilibrium right here, right? And now we're going to have a supply shifting outwards to the right. And now I have a new equilibrium price and a new equilibrium quantity. Triple star. <clears throat> and so this is really a theme of economics. The more that you complicate the model, the more moving parts that you have, the more cogs that you have, the less information that the model actually gives you. So as soon as we complicate it and say, well, actually two things are happening instead of one thing. Well, now the only thing that's really certain from this original, from this original point here, the only thing that's certain is that there's been an increase in the quantity, right? to this new point. We have no idea what's going on with the price because the first thing, the first shift that happened increased the price like this, right? It went up to P double star. And then my second shift, it decreased the price. So when you have a supply shift outwards and a demand shift outwards, The end result is you get an increase in the quantity and you have no idea what's going on in the price. Why don't you have any idea what's going on in the price? Because a shift out of demand, shift to the right of demand, increases our price, green arrow, and a shift outwards, shift to the right of the supply curve, decreases our price, orange arrow. We don't know the magnitude of those. I just drew it the way that I drew it. It looks like the price increases but it's a mirage, it's an illusion. If I would have said that, if I would have drawn the supply shift a bit more extreme, if I would have had the supply curve out here instead, then this new equilibrium, the price is actually below what was there before, right? That original gray P1. So 
but again, even if I even if I draw a supply curve that's crazy far out there, even if I have a supply curve that's right next to the original supply curve, my new equilibrium is always going to have an increase in the quantity. So at least it does tell me one thing. It tells me that my quantity increases, but it tell it doesn't tell me anything about the price. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. So another example. So now we're going to do our favorite gasoline. Hopefully by the end of my life, I'll be like, there was this thing called gasoline we used to buy. <laughs> Probably not, right? Um, so the price of gasoline fluctuates wildly, right? I mean, we've seen this in the last year. Um, but the book talks about what happened to the price of gasoline in October 2010 to may of 2011 so <laughs> 10 years ago right you guys are like eight or nine you guys don't really care but um let's just diagram it and then we can diagram what happened to the price of gasoline just recently as well so uh there was a 50 percent spike in gasoline in a six month period so gas went from 260 in October of 2010 to 390 in May of 2011. So what, what caused this spike in the gasoline? So let's go ahead and look at our supply and demand and take a look at it. So Starting out at this point right here with our equilibrium price at P1 and our equilibrium quantity at Q1. And so the first thing that happened was that there was a lot of supply uncertainties because of the Middle East politics and warfare situation going on. Uh, and so as a result, there was a shift to the left in the supply of gasoline. And there was refinery breakdowns. So there was Middle Eastern uncertainty. Let's get some colors in here. In the Middle East, and the Middle East is, you know, where most oil is produced there were also some uh refinery refinery breakdowns in the u.s so oil comes to the united states as you know crude oil and then it's refined into various forms of gasoline and jet fuel oil and race oil or race fuel, other kinds of things, right? Uh, so what did these two things do? If there were refinery breakdowns, how would that impact the supply or demand? It would shift the supply to the left. Very good. And the uncertainty in the Middle East is also going to shift our supply curve to the left. And then at the same time, uh, a lot of emerging countries like China and uh, India and those kind of countries, they started making more money. They started buying more cars. So there was a rising income effect. In China and other emerging economies plus the fact that cars are normal goods plus the fact that gasoline and cars are complements
right? You need the gas in order to get places. So all of these different reasons shifted our demand curve to the right. And so once again, if we trace what happens, so at first we have a movement along the demand curve when there's that first supply shift and we end up with a higher price and a lower equilibrium quantity supplied on the market. Then the increase in demand is going to result in what? A higher price But we have no idea what happens with the quantity because an increase in demand shifts quantity to the right, right? It increases my quantity. So I had a decrease in the quantity because of the supplied, because of the shift in supply, sorry, and then an increase in quantity. So my Q3, I have no idea what actually is going on there. I don't know if it's you know, to the left of Q1, to the right of Q1. It could be right on top of Q1 for all I know. So we just got to be careful of that. Whenever there's a simultaneous shift, there's going to be one of them that is ambiguous. So this one, what did we learn? We learned that if there's a rightward shift in demand and a leftward shift in supply, that's going to result in an increase in the price. And I don't know ambiguous result in the quantity. Come on, book. So now let's talk about gasoline that happened just in the last couple of years. Because instead of seeing a spike from 260 to 390, which is what this whole supply and demand curve is really trying to show, what did we had? We had a plummet of gasoline prices. So why did that happen? So the first thing that ended up happening was that OPEC, well, I don't know if it was the first thing, but they happened pretty much at the same time. So OPEC, which is the uh, cartel that controls all of the gasoline, the crude oil prices of the Middle East. So OPEC broke up. So they used to set prices and output collectively. So they did this in order to artificially keep the prices high so that they would end up being, you know, generating more money than otherwise. But they broke up. So they, they you know, they, 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 they had some fight and uh, people started to uh, um, defect from the agreement and started to just flood the market with oil. So OPEC broke up and uh, all these other countries started producing, you know, as much oil as they wanted. And so what did that do to the gasoline price or the gasoline market? So since oil is a, you know, crucial, the only right ingredient uh, is a factor of production for gasoline. When they produced all this extra oil, what did that mean? That meant that the price of oil went down. So when the price of that factor of production went down, then that meant that that supply curve for gasoline shifted out.
So when that supply curve shifted out, we ended up with a lower equilibrium price and a higher equilibrium quantity of gasoline on the market. And then what happened? Well, then COVID-19 hit and everybody not only stopped going to work, but also stopped taking vacations and stuff. Uh, so the demand for gasoline just for travel significantly shifted to the left. So with everybody working from home, you're not spending enough, as much money on gas. With everybody not taking vacations, you're not spending as much money on gasoline. And so what did this do? Well, any kind of decrease in demand is going to have further downward pressure on the price. And then this is one of those ones where, you know, we have some clear upward pressure on the quantity because of the supply, but then there's this downward pressure because of the demand shift. So anytime there's a demand shift, that's gonna be downward pressure until we get to this Q3 that we just have no idea what's going on. So what did we learn in this one? Anytime there's a leftward shift in demand, and a rightward shift in supply, we know that the price goes down and the quantity, who knows. Questions on that? Um, All right, let's move on. So let's go ahead and pause this. Did I play you guys?